Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back. This is episode number 404, The Baphomet, part two. But before we get into that, I've got some amazing news. Here's the big, surprising, amazing news. Masonicon at Southern Pasadena Masonic Lodge was off the chain. Now, I didn't record this in advance. I actually came home, and I'm recording this before I go camping for the weekend with the family. But I have to say, a major thanks goes out to Dago and everybody who was out there. Amazing talks by Brian Simmons, Mike Jarzebeck, Adam Kendall. An incredible piece by Art De Hoyos, Charlie Fisher... Angel Millar gave my favorite one over the weekend. We had uh, Joseph Wages. I mean, just just great stuff. I was so honored to be able to go out there and moderate some of the talks and interview Brother Johnny Royal, Evald Johnson, and uh, Phil Donlin on their work. Uh, just incredible. Adrian Fully uh, interviewed me and Mike Jarzebeck and Dago on the significance of the duality of man on the 20th anniversary of Fight Club. Uh, it was just a really great time. Masonicons are great, and uh, they're just amazing. And, you know, I wrote a review on them a while back for the Midnight Freemasons, and I think I ended it with something like, you know, every damn time I do one of these reviews for a Masonicon, whether that's Esotericon or Attleboro, or the one I just wrote this last Friday, which you probably want to check out. In fact, I'll, I'll read it in this episode in case you missed it, and we'll read that one first so that I can tell you some big news. Before we get into that, again, just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to South Pasadena Masonic Lodge for the wonderful time. It was like a party where somebody invited, you know, 150 or so of your best friends. It was just amazing. Uh, hats off to you guys, and uh, I'll say it again when I read the post, but A+. plus. So we'll get right into the first piece and some news right after this. Now comes the point in the show where I ask you to help support this show. How do we do that? Well, we have a bunch of different ways to do that today. If you head on over to WCYPodcast.com, you can click on Direct Donation through PayPal, which we briefly touched on in the beginning of the program. Of course, you can make that one-time donation, or you can sign up to be a monthly contributor. Contributing $2 a month, $5, or even $10 a month, whatever you choose, really helps the program out. Of course, we have a limited edition shop where you can pick up any number of items that come direct from us. Help us out by going to MasonicRevival.com, but also we have some other affiliates that are really important. Bankers Best, one of the most unique things we've ever done, is to work with Brother Levi Banker out of St. Louis who owns his own company called Bankers Best Beard and Skin Care. He's been so generous. If you head to WCYPodcast.com, click on More, then click on Bankers Best, and you can check out a bunch of the different products he's got. He's got a whole line of beard care products, skin care, oils, balms, all of this stuff, and he has been doing it a long time. He knows a lot about it. Everything is handmade, quality items. We even came up with the King Solomon's Reserve Beard Balm, which is a few years old now, but remains one of the great products that he still offers. Even the artwork on the bottle was done by a brother. The nice thing about this particular product is 50% of the proceeds come back to the program. If you're a history guy like me, then you'll be pleased to know that what makes the beard oil and balm very special is that it was made utilizing the fragrances specific to the exports of King Solomon's time and location, which is amazing. So black fig and honey is the formula. Luxurious scent, as Levi says, truly fit for our first grandmaster. If you use the promo code BBWCY357 at checkout, you'll also get a little bit of a percentage off. Please check that out. Bankers Best or just head on over to buybankersbest.com. We also have have a code with on it you can go to our website click on more than go to on it and you can click through any of the links here or just go to onit.com and use the promo code wcy at checkout you'll get 10 percent off and they'll send a little bit back to the program to help us out and of course it's business time the book that i wrote with john t ruark it is making some real waves and people are using it and seeing success so check that out on amazon you can click right to it you can get it on audible kindle or in print 
even on iBooks. And last but not least, I wanna ask you to check out the Great Books program. You'll see the banner for it on the left-hand side, Intellectual Linear Progression. Use the promo code WCY, or you can just click on that link there, and you'll actually go right to the website and hear a little bit from Scott Hambrick about how awesome the program is. So that's it. I hope you guys enjoy, and thank you so much for helping us out. All right, so first up, I want to mention that I hope you guys all checked out the Intellectual Linear Progression because I want to say the window closed for admission just a few days ago, and I understand it sold out pretty quick. So if you got in, lucky guy, lucky girl, whoever got in, I'd like to read you my first piece this week, and it's a piece that I wrote, and it's up on the Midnight Freemasons as of last Friday. And the reason I'll read this first is because there's some big news. All right, so here we go. A three-day-long meeting with no minutes by Midnight Freemason contributor Robert H. Johnson. July 11th, I pulled into my driveway at 10.30 p.m. I'd been at a lodge meeting that was meeting for the last time before they merged into another. I was relieved knowing I wouldn't have to make the 60-plus mile drive again. No sooner had I walked in my house did I have to start packing. All the necessities packed away neatly, bags set by the front door. Alexa, set an alarm for 5.10 a.m. Lights out. The next thing you know, I'm at 29,000 feet on my way to Burbank Airport, and from there to South Pasadena Masonic Lodge's Masonic Con, or SPML for short. I know you all likely read reviews of the Masonic Con event, which has occurred every year at the only U.S.-based lodge I'm a member of that has a charter currently, as Brian Simmons likes to remind me, Ezekiel Bates in Attleboro, Massachusetts. Two years ago, Dago Rodriguez came out to be a vendor there, and he was representing the Southern California Research Lodge's magazine, The Fraternal Review, one of the best out there. Dago went home after that weekend two years ago and started planning his own Masonic Con, and by God, SPML, with Dago as Worshipful Master, knocked it out of the park. I could give you a full rundown of events, as I've done before, but... This time, I'll be brief. We started with a seven-course festive board with multiple toasts celebrating pop culture icons within the craft. That was Friday night. The festive board included our ladies and many guests of honor. It went till midnight, and it was amazing. Day two began the speakers. We heard from Angel Millar first, who spoke about art in Freemasonry and pop culture iconography. You know, I personally enjoyed this presentation the most over the weekend. Nothing against my other friends. You know, we just have favorites sometimes. The other speakers included Charlie Fisher, Brian Simmons, Mike Jarzebeck, Adam Kendall, Joseph Wages, and Art de Hoyos. And by the way, Art de Hoyos was amazing, speaking on esoteric masonry. Not his typical thing, and it was so perfect. Thank you, Art. Thank you. There were screenings as well. Perhaps one of the most interesting things about these Masonic cons is that each one carries a regional flavor. In Attleboro, it's the original recipe. It's Coca-Cola. Refreshing, original, and feels like tradition. SPML was distinctly Hollywood. We watched the finale of Sacred Steel Bikes with Brother Jason Wilson, the star of the show. After was a Q&A with Brother Adrian Fully of Variety Content Studio. A unique part of the day was a screening of the movie Fight Club. It's been 20 years since that movie came out, and it has a distinctly philosophical flavor. Brother Fully, Grilled Dago Rodriguez, myself, and Mike Jarzebeck in a panel Q&A about the movie and the topic of duality of man. I think we did the movie justice, but I may be biased. At 6 p.m., we broke for dinner. I took off to King Taco with my brothers from Ezekiel Bates for some amazing Mexican food. After dinner, we talked about the benefit of these conferences, not only to support the research that we're doing, not only to have fun, but to come together and share, to see what works and what doesn't, and go back home with those nuggets of success. We implement those things and slowly and incrementally change the fraternity across the nation for the better. Next up, 8 p.m., we watched High and Outside, a baseball noir directed by Brother Evald Johnson and starring Brother Phil Donlan. The movie was fantastic, dark and reflective. Afterward, I conducted the Q&A, or an interview, with these two brothers. They shared their personal experiences on the movie, life, struggles, and everything else that goes into making a movie of this caliber. 10 p.m., 
we were able to see for the first time illuminated the true story of the Bavarian Illuminati, an incredible documentary written, directed, and narrated by Brother Johnny Royal, whose previous major project was 33 and Beyond, The Royal Art of Freemasonry. Since the movie isn't out yet, and I think I'm among the lucky few to have seen it, all I will say is that it is a must-see. After the film, I again interviewed and conducted Q&A with the director Johnny Royal. He was very candid about the issues he faced while making the documentary, but also shared personal thoughts on why it was important to tell the story of Adam Weishaupt. When we asked Johnny what the goal of all this is, he gave an eloquent answer. He said, uplifting consciousness and making this realm a better place is what we're trying to do. Was that it? No. We made our way back to the hotel and got some rest. Sunday began at 10.30 a.m. with a screening of some sizzle reels from Tim Hogan on a couple of new projects that he has coming up. I can't say much about them, but rest assured, they look fascinating. Also, I feel compelled to tell you that Tim Hogan bought me a coffee. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how you know you made it to the big time. Thanks, Tim. After this, Brian Simmons, the architect of the original Masonicon in Attleboro, Mass., gave a talk on hope. It was a perfect way to end the day, a talk that told us to get off our butts and do the work instead of hoping for it to transpire. Thank you to Brian. I could go on about the amazing weekend. I could regale you with the intellectual musings of Joe Wages and Adam Kendall. I could tell you that Art de Hoyos is an undercover spicy meme lord. I could tell you that I met with the Grand Master of the Women's Masonic Lodge of California. I could tell you that Dago Rodriguez lost it at the end of the weekend with tears of thanks. But some things you just have to experience. This weekend was certainly that, a real experience. In life, we go through the motions, the ordinary. If we're lucky, we have occasions that stand out. The birth of children, graduating, marriage, becoming a master mason or an adept in your own practice, landing your dream job, parachuting, climbing a trail, and sometimes it's a weekend with 150 best friends. Thank you all for these memories. I will treasure them always. As for the next iteration, well, I think I'm just going to plan a Masonic Con for Chicago, 2020. Look out. It's going to be rad. www.masonicconchicago.com What? That's right, everybody. I've been asked so many times that people complain so many times that we're not doing one around here. When is it going to happen? And I always say it's going to happen when you plan it. And it just hasn't happened. And so you know what? I just planned it. What are we looking like? Well, the details are forthcoming. Here's what we know. Chicago Masonicon will be on September 18th and 19th, 2020. It's over a year away. We need the time to do the planning because we're going to do it right. It's going to be up there with the rest of these speakers, vendors, festive board, fellowship, networking. It's going to be the official Masonic convention that will fall in line with Masonicon, Attleboro, SPML's Masonicon, Esotericon. If you go to the website, you're going to see that. You're going to see placeholders for speakers, vendors, and festive boards. Now, I can already tell you that the vendors, I've got a great list already. The speakers are pretty much all nailed down, but I cannot say who they are just yet. We've got links back to Ezekiel Bates' Masonicon, SPML's Masonic con and esoteric con so that you can check those out we've got tickets that are going to be up on the website soon as well we're going to offer a few different options a festive board ticket only general admission and an executive pass now uh, there will also be a place for you to subscribe with your email address where um, i can forward updates out to all of you there'll be a contact form and uh, we have our sponsors on the website as well so if you want to be a sponsor you can do that too we're going to make it a really fantastic event. I do have to give a disclaimer, right? Because this is not some sanctioned Grand Lodge thing, right? This is your favorite Masonic podcast host who is uh, putting together a giant party for all of us, okay? So the disclaimer is Masonicon Chicago is not endorsed by the Grand Lodge AF&AM of Illinois or any official Masonic body. This is a Masonic event so far as its content and does not constitute any regular meeting of Freemasons. The views and opinions expressed here and the rest are those of the speakers, event planners, and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. You've heard disclaimers like this many times before. We have to do that because, well, sometimes people get upset. So 
I believe we've covered the basics. Keep checking back for more. Again, MasonicConChicago.com. That's M-A-S-O-N-I-C-C-O-N. C-H-I-C-A-G-O dot com. Now, we're not going to be in downtown Chicago proper. Why? Because there's no parking. It's terrible. So we're going to be north of Chicago. We already have the location picked out. It's going to be wonderful. There's plenty of parking. We've got lots of space. It's going to be great. Again, September 18th and 19th, 2020. It's way out there. As we get people lined up and tickets go up for sale, you'll hear more about it. But I wanted to let you all know that it's going to happen Everybody's been asking for it. It's right here. And the best part is, is yes, it's in Illinois, but guess what? We are so close to the border. Hey, Wisconsin, come on out. Hey, Indiana, we're right here. Come on over. You're in Ohio. It's a 50 minute flight. Yeah, it's like $80 to fly in. So check it out. You could boat across the lake if you're so inclined. (laughs) September is still a really nice uh, month in Illinois for weather. Uh, You know, it's up in the air, right? It's the Midwest. So uh, it's been 95 degrees in September sometimes, but it's also been 95 degrees on Christmas Day. So it happens. But thank you again for everybody that's making this happen. Who am I working with on this? Well, who do you think is helping me out with this? Of course, Brian Simmons, Dago Rodriguez, and Joe Martinez are all helping me out with this. And this will be sponsored by my lodge. And, uh, of course, we've got some great help coming from the lodge as well, including our worshipful master, Brother Scott Duball, our senior warden, Spencer Hammond, and my junior warden, Brother Julian Rojas. Put it on your calendar. It's a whole year and months away. I'm hoping that we get it on your calendar now and you can come out. My goal is to pack the house. It's ambitious, but we're going to do it. All right. Now, next, we've got a great piece by illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison, the Masonic Minute. Let's check it out this week right now. I'm a big fan of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. I go every year. Here's a fun fact about that race. The Indianapolis 500 mile race has never been run in Indianapolis. Stick with me. I'll get back to the Masonic significance of that later. Back in my Demolay days, I was a member of Oriental Chapter in Indianapolis. We met in a magnificent building near the city center. Its entire first floor was an expansive lounge with plush leather chairs, couches, coffee tables, and smoking stands scattered around. Matching pool and billiards tables, massive and ornate, sat in the back of the room. I loved the place, especially the pool table. Oriental Lodge 500 F&AM owned the building and met there. That lodge, chartered in 1875, was a Masonic powerhouse. With a peak membership over a thousand, many of its members were movers and shakers of Indianapolis society. Among the more famous brothers who called it home were U.S. Vice President Charles W. Fairbanks, U.S. Senator Albert J. Beveridge, Conductor Fabian Savetsky, world table tennis champion Jimmy McClure, and railway president Bowman Elder. Over the years, the surrounding neighborhood changed and membership fell. Oriental merged with Evergreen Lodge, becoming Evergreen Oriental Lodge 500, and moved to a newer, albeit less distinctive building in the western suburbs. I visited the building once and was disappointed to discover the Demolay chapter was long gone. Meanwhile, the great old building that had been Oriental's home became the new home of Central Lodge No. 1, the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Indiana. As a bonus, the building itself is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. So. On a trip to dear old Indy, I had dinner with a lifelong friend who had been a member of that Demolay chapter with me, and had subsequently joined Oriental Lodge. We talked about Demolay and that lodge, 
and I discovered he was angry, really angry. So angry he had quit the Shrine and Scottish Rite in protest. In protest of what? I asked. Inquiring minds want to know. He explained there had been another merger. As a result, he was now a member of Northwest Lodge, located in the same building as the former Evergreen Oriental. Sadly, the Oriental name, probably along with much of its rich history, was lost. But what seemed to anger him more was the fact that he was now a member of Northwest Lodge 770. 770? What happened to 500? Why not take the lower number? Back to that little fun fact. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway is actually located in an incorporated town known as Speedway. As you can tell by its name, the town wouldn't even exist but for the presence of the famed brickyard. It is also the home of Speedway Lodge 729. Or should I say was the home? It seems in its infinite wisdom, the Grand Lodge of Indiana yanked, I think that was the term my friend used, yanked the number 500 and gave it to the lodge in Speedway, making it Speedway 500. Cute, Grand Lodge of Indiana. Very cute. And cheesy. Very cheesy. History and tradition be damned for a cheap trick that, frankly, not many outside the Masonic fraternity will ever care about. I completely understand my friend's anger. I also wonder if it might have ticked off some of the members of Speedway Lodge. I know it's only a number. Yeah, along with history and tradition and other things, the fraternity is supposed to embrace. It's the world we live in. Publicity and marketing seem to be ubiquitous. The likes of Google, Amazon, and Facebook are constantly hounding us to go here, go there, and ultimately spend money. While I think the Masons need to do a better job of promotion, I'd rather see a more classy way of going about it. We're swimming in advertising, promotion, and gimmicks. Poor substitutes for brotherly love, relief, and truth. Besides, what did Indiana Masons get from this? More members? I doubt it. For a follow-up stunt, I wonder if they plan to rename the Lodge the Verizon Wireless Lodge 500, brought to you by Pepsi. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. Brilliant piece by illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison. Thanks so much for putting these together for us all the time and for putting the videos together. So if you don't know, I've talked about it in the past. Uh, Brother Steve puts these things together as a video. We have them on our YouTube channel. So head on over to youtube.com, find our channel, WCY Podcast or Whence Came You, and hit the subscribe button. The more subscriptions we get, we can actually start to access some really cool features while I'm on the road and traveling, or maybe we want to do a really cool thing in another state. We can get access to YouTube studios and things. Head on over there and give us a subscribe. Uh, You'll get the episodes and anything else that we come out with as well. But just a reminder that all of Brother Stephen L. Harrison's narrated videos on the Masonic Minute are on our website. There are over 100 of them now. It's pretty fantastic. So please check that out. Again, many thanks to illustrious Brother Harrison. Check out his books on Amazon. You can also just click through our website and the bookstore, and all of his books are there hotlinked to uh, external sources where you can pick those up. So now the real reason that you want this episode, you sat through all my boring news in the beginning so that you could hear about Baphomet 
part two. So the article I'm going to read is called Baphomet Revisited by the Reverend Thomas E. Weir, PhD, a fellow of the Philalethes Society, Grand Prelate, Grand Encampment of the Knight Templar United States of America. Preface. The following text will be controversial, not because it should be, but because those with strongly held beliefs will make it so. It is a serious attempt to put in perspective how faith without understanding or toleration can only divide people. Those who feel that way, and they alone, have found the quote-unquote true way, abuse the rights of others. Freemasonry has always stood for religious toleration and the right of all individuals to express their faith as they see fit. Extremist groups trying to force their views on others will always attack anyone with an opposing point of view. This short talk amply demonstrates how religious beliefs and power can be abused in an attempt to force others to the quote-unquote true way. Now that is from the editor. And before I actually get into the piece, you know, there's a quote, and it's by Carl Jung. And Carl Jung said... Fanaticism is always a sign of repressed doubt. So think about that. All right, back to the piece. Religions are fiercely competitive. Many claim for themselves the exclusive mandate to speak and act for God. In contrast, Masonry believes and teaches that God, who, quote-unquote, maketh the rain to fall on the just and unjust alike, is the father of all and is continually pouring out his love and his blessings. He loves all his children equally. The religious differences between human beings is how we respond to his love. Unfortunately, every time we mortals discover the richness of God's self-revelation, we are tempted to organize and tell people that they can fill up only at our spiritual service station and nowhere else. I am not opposed to organized religion. I spent a substantial part of my life at the University of Edinburgh, working on answers to the questions of why we have a church, why we have a ministry, and what they should be and do. I found substantial answers, but I am not prepared to say that mine are the only explanations or that God depends on my cooperation or permission for anything. It is difficult for us human beings to understand God, since we are so far removed from Him and so tempted to confuse our interest with His will. The history of religion is a history of conflict, punctuated with wars of words and steel, between factions who insist that they are the sole or principal custodian of God's word and spirit. In extreme, some seem to believe that they have the authority to compel God, as well as the rest of us, to obey their will. There is no need to remind ourselves of the religious bloodshed that grieves God and man in many places of the world today. Because Christianity is the most widely supported religion of our culture, we are more conscious of the intolerance that occasionally comes to the surface in that faith. Since 1975 publication of Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution by Stephen Knott, some Christians have turned from their traditional enemies at other denominations and other faiths to vent their anger on Freemasonry. For example, Chick Publications of Chino, California published in 1991 a 24-page booklet by J.T. Chick with pages somewhat smaller than the dollar bill, entitled The Curse of Baphomet. The thesis of the book is that Masons worship a demonic god named Baphomet who is diametrically opposed to Christ. If you follow the storyline of the book, it is also possible to come to the conclusion that if one is a Mason, his son will attempt suicide and not recover. The pretext and pretense of the book are scarcely worthy of reply. However, there are some interesting points raised. In the story, comic strip style, state troopers arrive at the home of Sally and Alex Scott in the dark of night to tell them that their son has been shot. At the hospital... They are told that he attempted suicide and that he has no will to live. The distraught and disheveled parents are three days later greeted by a well-dressed and smiling Ed, who could be clipped out and saved for a book on how to be used as a car salesman. The parents have just asked the question, why has God done this to us? Ed explains that it is because the father is practicing witchcraft by being a mason and a shriner. Sally and Alex defend their Eastern Star, Masonic, and Shrine memberships. Ed insists that although he was once a Mason, he now really understands Masonry because he has learned about Baphomet. Every Mason will know, and those outside the fraternity must be told, that Baphomet is unknown to Masonry. It is actually a Christian term. Among the charges 
trumped up against the Knights Templar by King Philip IV of France and his people nearly 700 years ago, was an accusation that the Templars worshipped Baphomet, or the head of Baphomet. This dovetailed neatly with another charge, that the Templars favored the Mohammedans over Christians. Baphomet is a modification, a corruption of the name of the prophet Muhammad. Unaccountably, Ed explains that the Masonic appellation, the great architect of the universe, is another term from medieval Christianity, is not the god of the Bible, but is really Baphomet. Ugly, frightening, and completely satanic. Ed produces a picture of Baphomet with a goat's head, red eyes, and a flaming torch implanted at the top of the skull. The otherwise human figure sits with the legs folded underneath, wings are deployed from the back. The figure has female breasts, and symbols adorn the visceral area. The hands mock the traditional blessing of Christ. The right hand raised, the left hand lowered, the goat-headed figure, and the other symbols are frequently found in witchcraft, but are totally foreign to Freemasonry. The eastern star, Ed declares, is designed to hold a Baphomet's head without the torch. Albert Pike is quoted as saying that Masons know that Lucifer is God. The sovereign grand commander's patriarchal cross is described as the symbol of Baphomet. Ed convinces Alex to burn his Masonic regalia and repent the sin of being a Mason. On bended knees, Sally and Alex prayerfully burn their Masonic relics, and their son immediately begins to recover. And the book concludes, In a way, I am sorry Ed is wrong. It would be wonderful if prayer and a righteous life made everything happen the way we wish. Christian experiences teach that God does not work in such simplistic ways. God's people, individually and collectively, have often suffered undeserved pain in spite of their prayers and their holiness. We do not manipulate God in prayer. We cooperate with him. Ed, fictitious though he may be, travels in the wake of a one-time popular religious tradition. In the days of the Spanish Inquisition, religious beliefs and practices that did not meet the standards of the religious establishment were punished by death. Such executions were called, strangely, acts of faith. Auto de fe became part of the language of our common experience. Webster's Ninth New Collegiate Dictionary defines auto de fe as the ceremony accompanying the pronouncement of a judgment by the Inquisition and followed by the execution of sentence by the secular or civil authorities. In a broad sense, this term refers to the burning of a heretic. Perhaps the great irony was that many were converted under duress to what the Inquisitors considered orthodox belief, then executed so that they could go to heaven while in a state of grace and before they could sin again. Those being executed were less enthusiastic about the benefits of such immediate transport into eternal life than those making the arrangements. The ascendancy of the Roman Catholic Inquisition was followed by the heyday of Protestant persecution of witchcraft in the 16th, 17th, and early 18th centuries. Many pious and responsible persons swore that they saw the devil in one form or another, that they saw accused friends speaking with the devil or acting as his agent. A remarkable occurrence in the late 16th century was a solemn inquiry into a report that the devil had appeared in a Scottish church and had mooned, quote-unquote, those present from the pulpit. The incident was scrupulously believed as fact and was included in a book on witchcraft written by King James VI, later James I of England, and required to be taught in schools. It is paradoxical that the same King James 20 years later convened the leading scholars of the day to update the translation of the Bible into English. The result of their labors is the King James Version of the Bible. Some Protestants did not take kindly to the theological debate. As late as 1719, a theological student was hung at St. Andrews, Scotland, for unorthodox beliefs. Grading in seminaries is less severe these days. Christianity, great as its efforts are to proclaim the gospel and to serve succeeding generations as the incarnate presence of Christ in the world, has been the home base for some in great and trivial offices who enjoy condemning others and executing those whom they can by death or disgrace. Members of churches are human and liable to the sins of the flesh, most notably in this case pride. Those who would try to rekindle the flames of the Inquisition are trying to take us 500 years into the past. The Christian Bible teaches that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, and peace. Frenzied attacks on other religious bodies or upon masonry display little love, joy, or peace. 
Instead of love, there seems to be hatred instead of joy, a thirst for blood, and instead of peace, violent verbalization. It is interesting to note that the rise of masonry coincides with the decline of witchcraft, real and imagined, together with the hysteria and paranoia of such occult practices generated. Masonic ritual inherited from our ancient operative brethren was Christian. In time, it was open to all men of goodwill who will share the quest to know and serve God. Whatever the intention of God, religion seems to be cursed with the propensity to divide people against each other, as if God wished to be worshipped in a proliferation of Towers of Babel. In contrast, Masonry teaches respect for God and all his children. If we really devote ourselves to the profound task of serving God, deepen our faith, and truly commit ourselves to the call of God, perhaps we shall not have time to criticize others. About the author. The Reverend Thomas E. Weir, Director of Hospital Visitations for the MSA, earned a Doctor in Philosophy degree from the University of Edinburgh. His specialty is development of church and ministry in Scotland in the 16th and 17th centuries. He is a Fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland and a member of the Scottish Church History Society. Wow, what a great paper. Uh, I, I want to just mention, it dawned on me that the other day, I was reading something to my son, and he said, Dad, when you say the 18th century, or when you say the 19th century, is that the 1900s, or is that the 1800s? And I had to explain to him the difference. And so there may be people out there who are listening who might just make that logical jump, right? The 19th century must be 1900-something, right? Actually, just in case you don't know, if, if something says 19th century, it's really the 1800s. So... If we're in the 21st century, that means it's in the 2000s. So who remembers Duck Dodgers in the 21st and a half century? I think that's what it was, but it's kind of like that. So if that helps you visualize while you're reading, just remember that whatever the number is, they're talking about 100 years before. So the 14th century, 1300s, 13th century, 1200s, and so on and so forth. Even though I'm going back in time when I was talking about that, I guess so on and so forth might be the wrong direction. Anyway, enough about linear time. So as far as the paper goes, I really enjoyed how it has a message in there that I think is not lost on today. This sounds like maybe it should be read or could have been written for today. And it was probably written not too long in the past, the 20th, back in the 20th century. So yeah, uh, a great piece came out of the Masonic Services Association of America. Again, I try not to read these uh, too often because they do have their own podcast, which I highly recommend, and they do a great job. So please head on over there if you haven't already, and toss them a few bucks to assist with uh, the work that the MSA does, which is very important. That's it for this week. I really hope you enjoyed. I hope you're stoked about Masonic Con Chicago. I hope you get in your calendar right now and put it in there so that you're going to be ready to come out and hang out, learn some great stuff. Again, we're going to have a bunch of news and speakers coming over the next few weeks as I solidify the details, and then it's just the waiting game. When tickets go up for sale, we'll let you all know, so be ready. Now, With all that, uh, I hope you guys have an amazing next week. If you find some time, check out the Midnight Freemasons Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Each one of those days, there's a new article that comes up. And usually Todd Creason is posting on Fridays. I posted this last Friday. Uh, He said it was cool. So uh, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you liked the paper I wrote. So until next week, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.